Welcome everybody to the Revelation series part one. This is uh, the first live stream that we've had and we might be doing this for the next year and a half because that's how long it took. 59 parts so far but already looking over my notes from last time part one I, I've changed so many things. <laughs> I looked at the one thing I looked at the chart the overview and uh, I thought that's not right. <laughs> so out it went but I, I taught it as if it was right last time. So, um, and that'll be explained as we get into the teaching, but let's pray. And this part will get explained in the teaching. Holy Spirit, we need you. Thank you so much for the technology of today. This, this whole social media that can get out of hand has all of a sudden become your gift to the church, to the body of Christ. So we receive your gift tonight. I pray that your anointing, both with the teaching and the listening, and as I'm doing both, that you would anoint uh, my lips and also all of our ears because we're going to hear things that only our spirit can, can catch. So we pray first of all that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit. That's one of the things we forget with all the end times stuff is one of the first prophetic words that you gave regarding end times is that you would pour out your spirit on all flesh so that being the first sign, so we receive that today. If we are in end times at all, then that is the first promise. And it doesn't have to be end times for us to be filled with your spirit. But we're excited about the season that you've chosen us to live in. You've chosen us to live in this crazy time to see things perhaps unfold that no, one, no other generation could even understand and so far in 2020 that has been the case so lord we're honored to live in this season we want to be as as learned and prepared as possible so fill us with your spirit bless us as we read your 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 revelation to us to the churches we ask this in your name amen okay. amen so book of revelation we are only going to touch three verses but i do have an introduction that that i want to give you as well so that we can have a little bit more understanding of the book. First of all, as, as Genesis, which means beginning, is the book of beginnings, Revelation is the book of completion, and the beginning of the next age. So Genesis to Revelation, as I've often said, is this story. And we're in the middle of this story, but kind of, I think at the end, pretty close. Revelation means apocalypse. I love how the word, or how the world uses that in a scary way. But apocalypse means unveiling. It actually means a revelation. And it doesn't have to mean a scary one. It just means unveiling. It's the only book of the Bible that centers on future and prophetic events. What happens to the earth? What happens to the existing heavens? What happens to Satan? What happens to Israel? What happens to people, both believers and unbelievers? What happens to the spirit realm? All of this is explained, all of their, those destinies are explained in this book. Revelation reveals itself, and that's why I'm excited about going through this again, such as throwing out the, uh, the whole timeline. By the time we went a year and a half looking at Revelation, by the time we got to the end of the book, it'd be, oh, that's what that was talking about. It literally reveals itself, but it also reveals the rest of the Bible. We're going to be going back into uh, prophetic books like Amos and Isaiah. We're going to look at things that Jesus said 2,000 years ago in the New Testament. And Revelation clears up a lot of what was said in the Bible. So it literally reveals the Bible. So in the beginning of the book, when it says it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the Word, it just all ties together for me. He is the Word, and it reveals the Bible, the Word. So sure enough, Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Its purpose, and I might lose some viewers on this, but the, its purpose isn't to predict the future as much as it is to reveal Jesus. If God wanted the future to be clear, certain it would be clear. And, and such as, you know, I was talking earlier, I can't remember if it was part of the session or not, but how in Genesis, or in Deuteronomy, God was talking about the place where the priests would hold their sacrifices, but
but they didn't know what a temple was. They didn't know what Jerusalem was. So they weren't ready to hear a temple in Jerusalem. So God just said the place. And that's where we're not ready to, to we can't even comprehend, comprehend to God who is able to do more than we could ever hope for or imagine or ask for. That's, uh, the Bible makes it clear. So I don't think God is hiding anything from us. We're just not ready or we don't have the right frame of reference. I think it'll, it'll reveal itself in hindsight perfectly. We go, oh, I see that. The same as the Passover. When Jesus died and rose again, it was like, oh, I get it. It wasn't just a, a remembering of coming out of Egypt. It was a foreshadowing and a convocation or a dress rehearsal of what Jesus would do to save the world. So, the certainties in the book, and this will be highlighted over the next couple months. The certainties are, God is love, and the second is, He is in control. Because it looks chaotic, but there's constant reminders that He's in control, and no matter what it looks like, it's, it's, it's wrapped in love. <laughs> so that's going to be hard to swallow in a couple of the chapters, a couple of the, the imagery that we're going to see, but it's wrapped in love. We're going to look at Revelation chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but looking more at the lessons within the book than trying to interpret current events through it. Uh, but if the events of Revelation unfold as we're going through it, I think we'll see it again in hindsight, and it'll help clear up what we're actually going through in our world. So therefore, there's going to be two parts to this evening. The first is going to be this teaching, and then the second, once I'm finished teaching, we're going to open it up. I can see the chat is, is, uh, is vibrant, and we're going to open it up for you to submit questions and comments. We're going to have a discussion in the room, and uh, you can be part of that. Uh, I would ask, though, that you don't put your questions and comments in yet. Like, I don't agree with that, or, you know, I think you're off your rocker. Just leave that to the end, okay? Because <clears throat> it's a little distracting. So, uh, there are two schools of extreme thought with Revelation. One is that people who set theories as absolutes, like Jesus is coming back pre-trib, Jesus is coming back mid-trib. We're going to, and this is where the chat could really explode because there's so much, there's, there's so many people that are passionate about it, but Revelation does not give a timeline a definite timeline of the rapture. We'll give some parameters even tonight. But you, you gotta be careful when you put together lists of essential truths and then put something like pre-trib as one of them. We, we don't, and so there are people that do that with Revelation, or they definitely know who the beast out of the sea is, or they definitely know who the Antichrist is. The book of Revelation doesn't even use the word Antichrist. And the other, the other school of extreme thought is that people who feel revelation is too abstract and don't touch it at all. When I first was teaching it, we had a little pastor's round table. It was a luncheon. And all the pastors were going, you're crazy. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. And yet, revelation says, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. So that tells me we cannot neglect this book. Whether, whether we get it right or not, we can't just throw it off and let's just read the Gospels or the Old Testament. It uses vibrant imagery because it's describing another realm. The descriptions are sometimes symbolic, like when it, when it mentions something that looked like a locust or like a scorpion. And so that's when we can go back into the Bible and see where locusts and or scorpions and or figs, you know, things like that, show up. That's half the fun. And sometimes it's just, John uses the word because it's similar to an earthly object. <laughs> it's the closest thing he could think of to an earthly object. So he says, a scorpion's tail. Head of a lion with a scorpion's tail. But very little, and I wasn't sure how to, how to exactly phrase this, but... Very little can be taken literal, okay? But that's from an earthly viewpoint. It is a literal book if you're in the spirit realm, but very little of it. So some of the, some of the beasts, for example, that we're looking for, I don't think we're looking for 
something with horns and eyes and everything, because then later explains what the horns are and what the eyes are and the crowns are. So I came across this quote in a book called Verse by Verse through the book of Revelation. It says, if we think of the book of Revelation like a fairy tale that does not truly exist, then we will not gain the assurance of God's ultimate victory. We will allow ourselves to think of the pain of the present to an end in itself. We'll never gain a perspective of God's purpose for time. And, f and I'll just add, for a year like the one we're going through. We'll never understand why he allows pain and suffering to come into our lives, especially since Revelation is all about Jesus. The devil does not want us to understand it. Mm -hmm. And believe me, every time I go to study this book, chaos ensues. <laughs> so we don't need to get into that. We need the Holy Spirit to understand it. That's why I started praying, you know, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Open up our ears. Open up our understanding. No eye has seen, 1 Corinthians 2, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind can conceive, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. And if you followed my teaching at all, you know the difference between mind and spirit. That your spirit gets it. It's intertwined with the Holy Spirit. And it gets it. But your mind's going, uh-uh. That's dumb. That doesn't line up. One plus one does not equal three. You know, and we're, we're trying to logic everything out. Meanwhile, something inside of us, including salvation. Salvation is your spirit and the Holy Spirit are tied together. And you're going, I don't feel like a Christian. <laughs> I, you know, and, uh, am I? And, and that's your brain. So you need to shut your brain off at times by speaking out what you know in, in the word. And that's your spirit silencing your dumb brain. 1 Corinthians 2 also says, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Isn't that interesting? Because Revelation seems so cryptic, and yet God's going, No, I, I'm freely giving you this. This is what we speak, not in words taught by us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Oh, that's the book of Revelation there. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. So maybe that's why unbelievers think the book of Revelation is absolutely ridiculous because they don't have the spirit to help them discern what it is. So it's actually pretty good. You know, if someone says, oh, I'm a Christian, say, oh, what do you think about the book of Revelation? Oh, it's, I, I don't think it's relevant or whatever. Oh, well, that's an indication of the existence of the spirit, <laughs> apparently. Okay, so let's get into some of the book, not, not into the, the text quite yet. But the first thing I want to do is make John, the writer, the, the rev, rev, revelator, I shouldn't have even started with that word, we need to make him into a real person. So it's written by John, the son of Zebedee. James and John were brothers, known as the sons of thunder. He's the one that leaned against Jesus at the Lord's Supper. He, he referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. We read about him in Acts, remember Peter and John get pulled before the Sanhedrin for preaching and healing the crippled ba beggar in the temple gate. He's rumored to have never died. That's going to become relevant as we look at the occasion of the book. John 21, Peter turned and saw that the disciples whom Jesus loved was following them. And so it's John referring to himself as the one that, that Jesus loved. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. Only, he only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? John wrote the, the Gospel of John. And personally, I believe it was after he was 
taken up in the spirit and saw the revelation. Because it's almost as if, and it was written decades after Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's almost as if John, when he comes back from the vision on the island of Patmos, which we're going to get to, is he, he probably read the Gospels and went, hey, you're close. <laughs> but I've seen... But I've seen the superhero. I saw Clark Kent take off his glasses, and I've I've seen Jesus now, and almost didn't recognize him at first. And we'll get that gets into the teaching as well. So, um, I believe he wrote John, First John, Second John, Third John, after he saw the Revelation. Uh, sure enough, John was the only disciple not to be martyred. I believe John. Oh, there it is. Uh, so the occasion. So A.D. sixty. Emperor Nero burns down Rome and blames it on the Christians and launches the first organized persecution of Christians 30 years before Revelation. We see Paul getting caught up in that. Then, uh, 35 years later, Domitian, the new emperor, in AD 95, claimed to be a god. And when Christians wouldn't worship him, the next great persecution began. The Roman historian Tertullian reported, after being plunged into boiling oil in Rome and suffering nothing from it, that's John, he's reporting about John, it is said that all in the audience of Colosseum were converted to Christianity upon witnessing this miracle. <laughs> so they tried to kill John, but when you can't kill John, you got to do something, and you can't shut him up. You gotta, you gotta send him away. Thus, John gets exiled to the island of Patmos. We see that uh, in, in Revelation, in chapter one, in the ninth verse. It was a small, rocky island in the Asian Sea, uh, 30 miles from Ephesus, if you know when you geography in there. It was six to eight miles long and one mile wide. So it's just long island. And that's where John isolated from everybody, was taken up into the spirit to see what we're about to study. So the overview. Here's the new overview, and I apologize if you watched the old one. You can throw that video out. It starts with Revelation 1 is an introduction of Jesus. It's actually Jesus introducing himself, not just to the reader, but to John, who seems to not recognize him at first. So it's an introduction of Jesus. There are some very important attributes that are established about Jesus. We'll get there when we get to the teaching. Then Revelation 2 and 3 are the letters to the churches. So after Jesus is introduced, he says, Before I say anything about crazy creatures and events, I need to say something to you. I need to tell you how I feel about sin and the consequences, how I feel about your victories, and the blessings that will come from it. I just need to establish a few things. I need to talk to you before we get to the craziness. Then, after doing that, Revelation 4 and 5, he says, and, and now still before the crazy stuff, although there's some crazy stuff here, I need to take you to heaven, specifically to the throne room, the control room. I need to show you what's going on there. So he introduces himself, chapter 1. He says, I need to talk to you, the next two chapters. And then he says, I need to take you to mission control and show you that I'm in control. And then chapter 6 starts the craziness here on this planet. Now, chapter 6, you get 6 out of 7 seals that are open. And we'll get to what that means. Then Revelation 7, there's a few characters that are introduced. 144,000 and the great multitude. Then chapter 8, the seventh seal is open. So 6, 7, and 8 are the seven seals with a few characters introduced. Then, Revelation 8 and 9, six of the seven trumpets are blown, and that unleashes chaos on the earth. Then, 10 and 11, a few characters are introduced. The, the angel and the little scroll and the two witnesses. Then, Revelation 11, seventh trumpet. So from Revelation 8 to 11, you have the trumpets, all seven blown, with a few characters introduced before the seventh. Then Revelation 12, 13 and 14, more characters are unveiled. The woman and the dragon, uh, chapter 12, the beast in the tribulation, the one out of the sea, the one out of the, from the earth, that's 13. 
and then the lamb, the 144,000, again, you get a little bit more of a, a picture, and then the wine press of God's wrath, that's Revelation 14. When those characters and scenes are unfolded, you have Revelation 15 and 16, all seven bowls of wrath are poured out. And then Revelation 18 and 19 is all about Babylon. It's all about uh, why God had to do this and, and what's going to happen to them. And, and there's the, the, the woes over Babylon and the hallelujahs. And so it's all about Babylon, which we'll get to. So Revelation 6 to 19, the bulk of the book, is all about the tribulation. It focuses on that. And I'll just give a little hint, mainly because in the tribulation, it's impossible to be lukewarm. And I believe it's God's last opportunity for people to say, I'm in or I'm out. Then Revelation 20, the millennial age, then 21, 22, new heaven, new earth, and the new Jerusalem, the next story. Oh, I'm excited. I, I'm excited to teach this stuff. Oh, boy. So the timeline of end times, as far as we can see it, and I, oh, I almost said this is the absolutes, but as far as we can see it is this. You have seven years of tribulation. Well, first of all, we're in the church age. Okay, we're still in the age of grace. Uh, Jesus died and rose again, and those who believe in their hearts and confess with their mouth, they are saved. Then you have, to end off this whole science project, you have seven years of tribulation. Then halfway through the tribulation, you have the Antichrist declares himself God in the temple and enforces worship. Therefore, the rapture of the church has to happen, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it all adds up, has to happen sometime before halfway through the tribulation. The rapture has to happen sometime before that event. And we'll see that because of one of the seals that opens and the cause and effect of that moment. I hope that doesn't confuse everybody. It's clear as a bell in my mind. Then, the culmination of the tribulation is the second coming. Jesus comes in and kicks butt. It, it's pretty simple for him. Then, the old earth and new earth pass away. Then there's the final judgment. Then, the new earth, new heaven, new Jerusalem. So now, Let's get into the book. Just three three verses, so we won't overwhelm you, because you might be overwhelmed with the intro as it is. Revelation 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him, God gave him to show his servants what must, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to John. So you have this chain of, of information. It went from God to Jesus to the angel to John for us, to the servants. So it's all there in the, in the first one. Servants, interesting to note. As Christians, we're referred to in the Bible as children, heirs, kings, ambassadors, uh, priests, the bride. But here, we and John are referred to as servants. When it comes to God's cosmic plan for the human race, we are his servants. Uh, he's not there for us. We are there for him. And that's really important because we, we feel this is all about us. And God, I need this. And God, would you help me with this? And I have this decision and that decision. But no, we're, we're here for him, not the opposite. The story of creation is not about us. It's about him. And it's actually about him wooing us and wanting to walk with us. And as the master, he has a part for us to play. That's the other, the other thing, him calling us servants. As the master, he's saying, I got a part for you to play. And as we unfold this book, you're going to see that we definitely do. To show, 
It says, to show his servants what must soon take, take place. So specifically events. He's going to show John scenes. But understanding that all prophetic events reveal Jesus. Everything in this book reveals Jesus, one way or another. God is unveiling Jesus to us through the events outlined. The, the Father puts Jesus on display like no other book. The word soon or shortly is actually from the Greek that means great rapidly. Well, the, we're reading this 2,000 years later. <laughs> uh, to us, it's 2,000 years. But to God, the writer of this revelation, it'll still happen with great, great, great rapidly. Also noted in 3, the time is near. So there's all of these emphasis on this is going to happen any time. Got to go to 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9 and 15. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. And the context of this is his return, the rapture of the church, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. So 2,000 years later, we're actually only, in, in God's economy, two days later. But let me note something. Jesus rose, Jesus came back early the third day. Early the third day. Mm -hmm. Angel means messenger. It's used 70 times in Revelation. Uh, like Revelation 22, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. So right at the book ends it by saying this angel, which is a messenger, is to show us through John. And so though the word angel could be, by implication, could mean a pastor, I'd say since John is already a pastor and the revelation is set in mostly from the perspective of the Spirit, this most likely refers to a heavenly being, a, a heavenly angel. We also, the understanding that the spirit realm is the greater reality, and God uses supernatural being to deliver the revelation. So, and this is where I just want to harp on this one more time. We are, we are not bodies with the spirit. We are spirits encased in a body. And Revelation really shows us that because our bodies don't last long in this book. But our spirits last, well, you're, you're going you're gonna to at least get a history of a little over a thousand years mm -hmm. of what we will be doing in the spirit without these bodies. So you can kiss your body goodbye. Hallelujah. <laughs> Dad, hallelujah. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. Hebrews 11, this is the greater reality. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It was made out of what is invisible. Revelation 1 and 2. So this is the second verse who testifies to everything he saw. So John testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John witnesses to three things. Number one, the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And so what he is, he is seeing is living and enduring. The word of God is the spiritual realm. Jesus is the word of God, and he said he kissed his body goodbye. <laughs> so everything of importance, eternal, must be confirmed in the word of God. So second, so word of God, second, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke only what the Father told him. John 12, 49, for I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me, commanded me to say all that I have spoken. That's crazy. I... I I wish I could do that, you know, to be that in tune with the Father, that everything he said, I said, and nothing that I say would be on my own. Mm -hmm. He was and is the Word of God, John 1, 
one, of course, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John testified to the Word of God, the testimony of, of Jesus Christ, and to the things he saw. All things that he saw appears 54 times in this book. He says, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this. Uh, I saw occurs another 37 times. A testimony is the most powerful proof, isn't it? I mean, once there's a testimony, it shuts down discussion. I, the, the blind man, all I know after all the debate is that this morning I woke up blind, but now after Jesus touched me, I can see. Shut down the discussion. And we're going to see later in Revelation 12, they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So it's all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the word of God, the testimony of Jesus and what he saw can vary because of perspective. Revelation 1, the third verse, and this is the last one we'll look at tonight. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. A blessing. What is a blessing? It actually means to make happy, uh, being fortunate or privileged. And so when God makes you happy, it takes you to another step of joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's not just a feeling of happiness, but, but joy. We will be blessed when we read Revelation because it's about Jesus. So reads is the first blessing, 2 Timothy 3, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, interesting that this revelation is written to the servant, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. So you read it aloud, perhaps publicly like we're doing now, and the added blessing is, and blessed to the one who hears, and I've really, really turned a corner on this, Romans 10, 7, 17, faith comes by faith. So the evidence of things unseen, which is definitely what we need here, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So us doing this will boost our faith, if nothing else will boost our faith. The last time I taught this, my life was being devastated, and this is what got me through. Amen. All through the second and third chapters, Revelation, uh, Jesus says constantly to each of the seven churches, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. There's a difference between listening and hearing as well. Just look at little children. <laughs> What did I say? And they can tell you what they say, but are they doing it? No. Which is the next part. Another blessing to take it to heart. James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So the added blessing, because it's the one thing to read it, it's another thing to believe and act on it. The other thing about hearing it is that this is borrowed breath. And as I speak it out, I speak using the breath that God gave me, comes out into the light, into the atmosphere, and, and, and I'm using my tongue, which is also a big part of, be, of becoming perfect, and we're using words. And who is the word? Jesus. So now, to close, let's go to the end of the book, Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I'm coming quickly, Jesus says. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So the majority of Revelation is apocalyptic, so it's revealing and unveiling events and scenes, but it's not necessarily a directive to follow. So, since the letters to the churches, chapters 2 and 3, which we're coming to very soon, are full of directives, the beginning, though it may not be as interesting to some, the beginning of this book, when Jesus is saying, is giving the directives, that is important because those are the parts that we keep and we take to heart. So this is simply another warning not to neglect the book of Revelations and can be applied to the rest of the Bible as well because the full and complete prophecy, the full and complete revelation is this whole thing. So remember, blessed 
No matter what you read in this book, and it's going to be important as we go through these weeks, no matter what we read, no matter how tragic or bloody or mean things look, it's all about blessing and God is love and God is in control. Amen.